Revelation chapter 3, as we continue our study of Jesus' words to the seven churches of Asia. Right now we are looking at Jesus' words to the church in Philadelphia. That's Philadelphia of ancient Asia Minor, not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, by the way. And uh, a few Wednesdays ago, we looked at the history of the city of Philadelphia, uh, because the city of the history, I'm sorry, the history of the city of Philadelphia is going to have some impact on what Jesus says and why he says some of the things he says to the church in Philadelphia uh, here in these verses. So right now we're looking at verses 7 through 13. We're going to at least finish verse 7 today. And um, so here in Revelation chapter 3, this is the second portion or the second section of the book of Revelation. According to Jesus, John is writing the things that Jesus showed him which are, are presently. He's writing to the churches that existed in John's day, but because the church is still here on earth, all of the words that Jesus has to say to all seven of these churches apply to Christians in every church, in every age and every uh, era and period of time since church, in, in church history. And so these words are pertinent to us as well. And so here in verses 7 through 13, Jesus is speaking to the faithful church. This church is considered the faithful church of Philadelphia. And so in verse 7, like I said a few Wednesdays ago, we already looked at the history of the city of Philadelphia and how that impacted the church. And so now we pick up here in the second part of verse 7 that we actually began this past Wednesday night. And what we're looking at right now here in verse 7 is the clear description that Jesus gives of himself to these believers in Philadelphia, to this church, as he's writing this letter to them. And so, if you remember, in each of his letters to these seven churches, they primarily, all those letters primarily have the same pattern. And so they all begin the same way and pretty much have the same pattern as Jesus speaks to them. And so, like all the other churches, Jesus begins his letter to Philadelphia here um, by giving a clear description of himself to this church that comes from, from John's vision of Jesus in chapter 1 and the description Jesus gives of himself to each church is pertinent to his message to that church. Okay? And so if you would look at verse 7. John's writing what Jesus is speaking to him and showing to him. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write... And of course, the word angel here is the word angelos in Greek, which could refer to an angelic being, or it could refer to a human being, but the word angelos means a messenger. Most likely, here it's referring to a human messenger of this church, which was probably the pastor. So he's most likely speaking to the pastor, and to the pastor of the church of Philadelphia, write these words. And notice now Jesus gives this clear description of himself. He says, these things says, he who is holy. You see that? The first description Jesus gives of himself, which we looked at Wednesday night, is he is holy. When Jesus says he is holy, what he is telling them is that he is deity. He is divine. That he himself is God. Okay? So he is holy. And then he also says... He who is true. He who is true. The word true here actually speaks of genuineness, authenticity, realness. In other words, Jesus is saying, because I'm God, I always act and I always speak in consistency with my nature as God. In other words, when Jesus says here to the church that he is true... He's saying that he is dependable. You can trust him. He's true. He's dependable. 
So he tells them, number one, that he's deity or he's divine, he's God. And number two, he tells them that he is dependable. And then number three, he's going to tell them that he is the determiner of doors. The determiner of doors. Look what he writes and says. He says, he who has the key of David. And then he says, and he who opens... And no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Jesus is telling the church, I'm the one that determines which doors get open and which doors get closed. It's interesting, there was a man one time who saw a distraught young lady weeping beside her car. Do you need some help? The man asked. She replied, well, I knew I should have replaced the battery in this remote Door unlocker. Now I can't get into my car. Do you think that they, and she was pointing into a distant convenience store down the road, do you think that they would have a battery to fit this? Hmm, I don't know. Do you have an alarm too on your car, he asked. No, just this remote thingy, she answered. And then handing it and the car keys to the man as she said that. Then as he, the man, took the key, he took the key and he manually unlocked the door to the car. And then he looked at the woman and told her, he says, hey, why don't you drive over there and check and see if they have some batteries because it's a pretty long walk. (laughs) See, Jesus says he's the one who has the key and only he can unlock doors, or he can lock doors. Unlock and lock, open and close, open and shut. Now, it's interesting, the word key that he uses here when he speaks of the key of David, the word key is the Greek word kleis, and it denotes one or a person who has a key. And the keeper of such keys had the power to open and shut chambers, that were filled with treasures in that day and time. And since the keeper of the keys has the power to open and to shut, the word kleis is used figuratively in the New Testament and throughout the New Testament to denote power and authority. So when Jesus says that he has the key of David, he's saying that he has power and authority to open and to close. See? And so what's interesting is Jesus' statement here in verse 7 is actually a quote from the Old Testament. It's a quote from the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. Now that should be easy for you to remember. So if you want a a good Bible verse to to memorize, memorize this one. I don't know how much easier you can get than Isaiah 22, 22, okay? So in fact, I want you to hold your place here in Revelation chapter 3, and I want you to turn with me in your Bibles back to Isaiah chapter 22. The major prophet, Isaiah, in the Old Testament. Isaiah 22. And we're going to take a look at the scripture that Jesus is quoting here and look at the context of it to help us understand more of what Jesus is saying to the church of Philadelphia. Isaiah chapter 22, and if you would, let's begin reading in verse 20. And what's interesting is the context here is this is set in the days of the king of Judah, King Hezekiah. And the Lord is actually removing Hezekiah's steward, uh, the one who manages his palace, and who has access uh, to him personally and to all of his goods as the king. And he's replacing him because he was full of pride and he ended up being a wicked man. So the Lord is replacing this man named Shebna with another man by the name of Eliakim. That's the context here. And so in verse 20, the Lord is speaking through the prophet Isaiah who was prophesying in Hezekiah's day. And in verse 20, look at your Bibles, it says, Then it shall be in that day. 
that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe. So this is the Lord speaking through Isaiah to Shebna, saying, Shebna, you're fired. You're out. Eliakim's in. I'm going to clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now here comes verse 22. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. Do you see that direct quote there in verse 22? This is the only other time in the Bible that the key of David is mentioned. And it's quoted by Jesus in Revelation 3, 7, and it's right here in Isaiah 22, 22. And so he goes on to say in verse 23, I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place, and he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. So Eliakim becomes the new steward, the new manager over the house or the, the, over the house and the palace of King Hezekiah, which means that he has access to the king. He also has access to all the king's treasures. And so he can literally, as the steward and the manager, today we would call him the chief of staff, is what we would call him. And he has authority over everything that belongs to King Hezekiah. And so that's interesting. And so Hezekiah's servant Eliakim was given authority over David's house. The reason we, it says David's house, and speaking of David, uh, is because you know, King David um, is the one that eventually the Messiah would come through. We'll talk about that in a moment. And so the kings of Judah uh, were always considered to be of the house of David because David was, from, of course, from Bethlehem in Judah. And uh, actually, we could say that David was the first king of Judah, though when he was king, he was still king over all of Israel. It was still one uh, kingdom at the time. So, here in this passage, it's telling us that Eliakim basically became the ultimate gatekeeper he had access to the king's presence and to his treasures. He became the ultimate gatekeeper, granting access to the house of David, or literally to the palace of Hezekiah, at his discretion. Nobody got in to see the king, and nobody got any of the benefits of the king, unless Eliakim gave the okay. Unless he, in using his authority said, I'm opening the door for you to come and see the king or to take part in his treasure, or I'm shutting it to you and you can't get in. And so this is the illusion Jesus is making now in Revelation 3-7 to himself. Jesus now in Revelation 3-7 claims to have possession of this key, the key of David. But why? Why would Jesus make such a claim? Well, I'm going to give you just two reasons. One from the text here in Isaiah 20, or in Isaiah 22. But the first one I want to give you is concerning the Davidic covenant. God made a covenant, an unconditional covenant with David. When David was king, if you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David loved the Lord so much that he wanted to build God a permanent house. As you know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt... And God delivered them from Egypt. They wandered 40 years in the wilderness. Do you remember where God lived when he dwelt among his people? He lived in a portable temple, in a tabernacle, in a man-made tent. And it wasn't permanent because every time the children of Israel would leave and go to the next spot that the Lord was leading them to, of course, they had to take up God's house and pack it up and take it with them and set it back up again. God was living in a tent. And then even after the Israelites, then after that 40 years, came into the land that God gave to them, 
For many, many years, God still lived in the tabernacle. He still lived in a tent. And in fact, at the time of 2 Samuel 7, God is not living in the tabernacle anymore because it seems to have been destroyed. He's living in a little tent in David's backyard. David wanted the presence of God so much that he made a place for the Ark of the Covenant to be brought to there in Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant was, of course, that article of that article and furniture, piece of furniture that was in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle that represented the throne of God and the presence of God. And so David had, since his palace and his throne was in Jerusalem, he wanted God's presence to be there with him. So he had the, the Ark of the Covenant brought to Jerusalem, and he built a little tabernacle for it. It's called the Tabernacle of David. He, and he had the Lord's presence there with him. But as David looked at his own life and saw how good he had it, I mean, David's like, man, I got a palace. I'm a king of, of Israel, and I got a palace. But yet, here's the king of the universe, and he's living in my backyard in a tent. So David wants to build a house for God in 2 Samuel 7. And so as he wants to build a house for God, he starts making all these plans and things, and, and then he calls upon the prophet Nathan and tells him, says, hey, here's my plan. I'm going I'm to build a house for God. Nathan's like, yeah, do it, bro. It's like, I, I can't think of any better thing for you to spend your resources on. Yes, God needs a house. And then the Lord speaks to Nathan and tells Nathan, says, because of David being a man of bloodshed, he can't build a house for me. I don't want him building a house for me. You go tell him, no, don't build a house for me. Boy, would you want that job? Being the prophet of God, you have to go to the king and tell him, no, you're wrong. I mean, that's what Nathan had to do. But instead, the Lord spoke to Nathan and told him, said, you tell David not to build me a house. I'm going to build him a house. And when God told Nathan to tell David, hey, I'm going to build him a house, what he was talking about was not a physical house, not a palace, but he was talking about he was going to build from David a dynasty of kings that eventually would come the king of kings, the Messiah, the son of God himself, from his line. So that's why the kingdom of Judah in the south was always referred to as the house of David. See, David was born there. David first ruled there. Then he ruled over all of Israel from Jerusalem. But it was because of this promise that God made to David. I want to read it just a couple of verses to you. 2 Samuel 7, 12. Here's what it says. It says, when your days are fulfilled. This is God speaking to David. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you. He's talking about his son, one who would come from himself. He says, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Now the near fulfillment of that was Solomon, because Solomon was the son of David, who came from David's own body, that God set up next as king and chose as king of Israel and king of Judah. But that was the near fulfillment, but there was a future fulfillment and a far fulfillment in this prophecy and promise that God is making to David. And here's what it says in verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Well, Solomon was a man. Solomon died. So Solomon cannot be the ultimate fulfillment of this covenant that God is making with David, that you're going to have a son and he's going to rule and reign on the throne of Israel forever because Solomon died. He's just a man. But then the Lord says this to David, Your throne shall be established forever. So there's more to this. This is speaking of way more than just Solomon. It's speaking of one who would eventually come from David's line, from Solomon's line, who would eventually take the throne of David, become king of Israel, and not only rule Israel, but actually the Bible tells us would rule the entire world. You and I know who this is. 
the New Testament makes it abundantly clear that the ultimate fulfillment, the far fulfillment, the future fulfillment of what David, this promise that David made or God made to David was concerning Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. How do we know that? There's many verses. I'm only going to, for time's sake, I'm going to read one of them to you. Ready? Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. The, the angel Gabriel went to Nazareth, spoke to Mary, and told her that she was going to be the one who was going to conceive by the Holy Spirit and give birth to this one from David's line that God promised David would be king forever. And it says this. The angel spoke to Mary and said in verse 32 of chapter 1 of Luke, He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Highest, meaning he's the Son of God, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now that's interesting because Mary was the physical mother of Jesus, right? She was from the line of David. But if you remember, when she conceived, she was a virgin. She was betrothed. She was engaged. Had not consummated her marriage yet with her fiancé, Joseph, who Joseph would become the foster father of our Lord Jesus, the one who would take care of him and raise him and mentor him. And... But what's interesting is Joseph also came from the line of David. In fact, Joseph was in that line of kings. Joseph had a right to the throne of David. That's why God chose him and chose Mary. Because Mary was betrothed to Joseph. See, very interesting. And in verse 33, it says this, concerning the son of the highest, the son of David. In verse 33, it says, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, that's Israel, forever. See that? Forever. And of his kingdom, listen to this, there will be no end. That's just one, or well, two verses. Just one little passage from the New Testament that confirms that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's unconditional covenant to David that he would have one who would come from his line, who would sit on the throne of Israel and rule and reign forever. And that's literally going to happen in the future. At the second coming of Jesus Christ, as you read Revelation chapter 19 and you read chapter 20, you see that Jesus comes, and one of the things he will do is he will set up his throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign over the world and his reign will never end. Okay? So, incredible. So, why could Jesus claim to have the key of David? Because of the Davidic covenant. But number two, I want to show you something here in the passage that I think is interesting. Also, Jesus could claim to have the key of David because Eliakim, here in Isaiah chapter 22, is a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Okay? Let's look at it real quick. If you would, notice his name in verse 20, Eliakim. The name Eliakim literally means this. God raises and God sets up. That's what his name means. And obviously that's what God did with Eliakim, didn't he? He got rid of Shebna. And in his place, as the chief of staff for King Hezekiah, he raised up and set up Eliakim to, you know, this position of authority. Yeah. But how does that concern our Lord Jesus? Well, how did Jesus get his power and his authority? Well, the Bible is very clear. Jesus died just like Solomon. He died, but he didn't stay dead, right? He rose from the dead. In fact, if you remember in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus said this about himself. He said, I am he who lives, 
and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And then he says this, because I died and I defeated death and I rose again, he says, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus is saying the reason now he has keys and he has power and authority is because when he died, he rose again. Do you see that? So, Eliakim's name means God raises. Yeah, when Jesus died, the Bible tells us what? God raised him from the dead. Do you see that? And not only that, God not only raised Jesus from the dead, but when Jesus ascended back to heaven, God set him up as king. Set him up, gave him authority. That's why Jesus, when he returns in his second coming, is going to come the second time to rule and to reign over the whole world because God has set him up as king. And one of the places we read about this in the Old Testament is in Psalm 2. Let me read to you Psalm 2, verses 6 through 8. Listen to the verbiage here. Remember, Eliakim's name means God sets up, and here's what God says in, this, in Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is a, Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. It's speaking of the Messiah to come. God is saying, not only did I raise my son from the dead, but I have set him up after that to be king over all the earth forever. And then it goes on to say this, I will declare the decree. Now, now what's happening is the Messiah is speaking here, and listen to what he says. I will declare the decree. The Lord, Yahweh, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Did you know that? Did you know that the Old Testament speaks of not only God having a son, but speaks very clearly here of the virgin birth, that God is the one who bego had begotten His Son? The Old Testament says that. There it is, Psalm 2, in verse 7. So the Messiah is saying, Yahweh, or the Lord, said to me, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. So we know from the New Testament, He's speaking of Jesus. This is a Messianic Psalm. And in verse 8, the Lord says to His Son who is the king, he says this, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. In other words, I give you authority over the whole earth. And here's what is amazing. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, after his resurrection and as he is going to ascend back to heaven to the Father, Jesus makes this declaration. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You see that? So, Eliakim is a type of Christ, you see, because his name means God raises up and God sets up. And God did both of those things with his son Jesus. Okay? Now, there's something else I want you to see here real quickly. In verse 22, look what it says here. Look at your Bible, Isaiah 22, 22. And I want you to know it says, The key of the house of David, in other words, the power and the authority of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. Do you see that? He's speaking there of Eliakim, but Eliakim is a type of Christ. Well, you know what? The same prophet, Isaiah, spoke this same thing of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus, back in Isaiah chapter 9. A scripture we usually read at Christmas time. But trust me, it's appropriate any time. Because Jesus is always king. Not just at Christmas. Okay? And he's not only the resurrected Lord at Easter. Just letting you know that, okay? For all you CEOs. You know what CEOs are, right? People who only come to church on Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter only, right? No, I'm just... Anyway. That's a joke. I'm not serious. Listen, I'm a preacher. People poke fun at me all the time, so... Anyway. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. 
Listen to what it says. For unto us a child is born. So from Israel's perspective, from the human perspective, the Messiah came, the Son of God came to earth as a child, as an infant being born, as a human. But then it says, unto us a son was given. See, from earth's perspective, when the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God came, He came as a child, born into this world. From God's perspective, from heaven's perspective, a son was given. Because Jesus was always, before He was ever born in Bethlehem and born as a man, Jesus always was the eternal Word of God, the eternal Son of God. And so that's why He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And then He says this, listen to this, right? And the government will be upon His shoulder. That's exactly what he said to Eliakim in verse 22. Yeah, but he spoke it, he spoke it, Isaiah had spoken it, and the Lord had spoken it through Isaiah way before this, back in chapter 9, concerning the Messiah. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Hmm. If you would, look at the end of verse 21. He shall be a what? What's it say? A father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It says, and the prince of peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. There it is again. When Jesus receives the key of David, when God raises him and sets him up, he's king forever. There it is again. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So now you understand why Jesus said what he said to the church of Philadelphia there in verse 7. So let's go back. Let's turn back to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, we're here in verse 7. And so not only, now listen, not only does Jesus have possession of the key of David, but do you know that he also has position, uh, I'm sorry, he also has possession of other keys as well. Okay? Uh, again, the Greek word for key in the New Testament, the word that's used here, kleis, it's not used that often at all in the New Testament. But every time it's used, it speaks of a key that Jesus is the one who possesses. So he possesses the key of David, but he also possesses the key of knowledge. You'll find that in Luke 11.52. There's a key of knowledge. Matthew chapter 16, verses, verse 19, it speaks of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has possession of those and told Peter, I'm going to share them with you. Revelation 1.18, we've already read it. Jesus has the keys of Hades or hell and of death. And then in Revelation 9.1 and Revelation 20 verse 1, it speaks of another key. It speaks of the key of the bottomless pit. Isn't that amazing? You know what that means? That means Jesus has authority. The bottomless pit is what's called the abuso in Greek. The bottomless pit. It's the place where in the book of Revelation, when that pit is opened, demons come out of it. It's also the place in Revelation 20 when Jesus opens that, gives, gives the key to an angel, opens it up. He throws Satan into it for a thousand years and locks him in there. You know what that means? That means our Lord Jesus has all power over demons and over Satan. Never as a child of God, as a son of God, as a daughter of God, never fear demons and Satan. Because though they are powerful, and they are more powerful than you, if you stand in your own strength, okay? But John wrote in 1 John, if you remember, he said, you know what? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. As a Christian, you never need to fear demons 
And you never even need to fear Satan. Because Jesus has the keys and the power and the authority to do whatever he wants with them at any time. And in fact, we don't have time to go into this, but I can make a very good biblical case from both the Old Testament and the New Testament that proves that whatever Satan does in the life of a Christian, he has to get permission from the Lord Jesus before he does it. Hmm. Wow. So, that should give you great comfort that when the devil and his minions are giving you a difficult time as a Christian, you don't need to fear. You can take, take great comfort. In, My Lord is in control of this. See? That's amazing. But Jesus possesses all these keys. Now, I want you to notice here, look at verse 7, and I want you to know Jesus' words when he says that he's the one who has the key of David. Notice this next phrase. Because he has the key of David, he opens and no one shuts. Do you see that? So Jesus, with the key of David, has all power and authority. And he says he's the one who opens and no one shuts. Now, one of the places where this word opens is used in the New Testament. The Greek word is used in the New Testament. It's used many, many, many places. But one of the places is very interesting. It's in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. And of course, it's the account of when the Magi, or the wise men, traveled from the east and came to the house of Joseph and Mary to visit, by that time, the child Jesus and to offer him some gifts. Remember that? And not only offer him gifts, but to come to worship him. Let me read for you Matthew 2, 11. Listen to what it says. It says, And when they, that's the Magi or the wise men, when they had come to, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, same word, the wise men opened their treasures. It says they presented gifts to him. That's the Lord Jesus. The baby, or not the baby, but the child Jesus. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, why is that important? It's important because, listen, just as the wise men opened their treasures and gave gifts to the Christ child, so Jesus, as the keeper of the keys, has the authority to open the treasures of heaven and to give them to his children. What is it that you need as a Christian? What is it that you need? Why do you look to other people as if they're going to supply what you need? They're not. They can't. No human being is an everlasting source of whatever you need. Not your spouse. Not your children. Not even your pastor. Listen, you can leech on and you can draw and draw and draw from people until you drain them dry. And then they'll have nothing else to give you. Because no person is an everlasting source of whatever you need. Only the Lord Jesus is. And he has at his disposal, okay, the treasures of heaven. And he can open them to you when you need them. Never forget that. And so, with these keys... With his keys, Jesus has the authority to grant access to a whole lot of heavenly riches. Okay? I'm just going to give you a couple, just four of them here, but there's a whole lot more. Let me give you a for instance. Number one, Jesus has the power and authority to grant you access to God himself. Do you know without a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, you have no access to God? You realize that? Unless your faith is in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and for eternal life, you don't have access to God. Isn't that amazing? Why? I'll tell you why. Jesus said he's the one 
who gives you access to God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus has the key to open the door to give you access to God himself. Okay? And through the cross, he has swung that door wide open. It's up to you now to believe him by faith and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And you'll have access to God himself. Let me give you another scripture, Ephesians 2.18. Ephesians 2.18 says this, For through him, that's through Christ, he says we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Okay? So not, listen, not only does Jesus have the key to give you access to God initially so that you can come into a relationship with Him, but Jesus also has the key to you when you're a believer to give you continual access to the presence of God. And I can tell you what, as a believer, there are going to be times in your life, again, when no person can help you, no thing can help you, and you're going to have, listen, you're going to have problems in your life, you're going to have issues, you're going to have circumstances, you're going to have those times in your life where you are going to need access to the presence of God. In the Psalms, the psalmist told us that in the presence of God is joy evermore. Can I just be honest with you? There have been times, even as a pastor, where the ministry has gotten so heavy, where the battle has gotten so intense, where there was no one I could go to to talk to. No one. No one I could trust to talk to about certain things. Sometimes the battle would get so heavy that I think this is it. This is the end. And my only recourse was to get alone by myself with the Lord, come into His presence, spend time with Him, And at my loneliest moments is when I go to him and then I'm not alone anymore. Jesus gives us, as believers, that kind of access to the presence of God where we can escape, at least for a little while, the tumult and the chaos of what's going on around us in this realm. And we can enter a whole different realm where there's peace and there's joy and there's hope. And that will get you through. And Jesus has the key to that for you. He can grant you that access. It's only because of what Jesus has done for us that we can approach God, both initially and continually. But I thank Him for that. Don't you? Amen. Number two, Jesus can grant to you, if you need it today, He can grant to you salvation. He has the key to salvation. How do I know that? Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says this, Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And I would add the word can be saved. (laughs) In other words, Jesus has the key to salvation. Do you need to be forgiven of your sins today? Are you here today and are you apart from God, away from God? Do you, are you here today without a relationship with God through faith in Christ? If you're here today and you do not have the assurance that your sins are forgiven, you don't have the assurance that when you die you're going to go to heaven, or if Jesus comes and raptures the church away, that you're going to go be with Him. You don't have the assurance that you have eternal life and that 
Your life has been made new through Him giving you the Holy Spirit and giving you a new nature. If you've never experienced that, you can experience that today. Why? Because Jesus has the key to salvation. There's no other name under heaven whereby you can be saved except the name of Jesus. And today, if you will believe the gospel and you will trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, He will forgive you of your sins, give you His Holy Spirit, make you a new person, okay, and give you eternal life. See? All for the repenting, turning from your sins, and for the believing, trusting in what He did for you. He's the one who lived the perfect life you couldn't live and died the death you should have died for your sins. He did all that for you and raised from the dead so that you could be forgiven and have eternal life and give His life to you. So after the service, when we're done this morning, if you need salvation this morning, listen, come and let's pray together and receive it because Jesus has got the key to it. Okay? Number three, here's something we all need, knowledge. Jesus has the key to knowledge. Listen to what Paul said, Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3. He said this, he says, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See? Yahweh, the Lord God as King over the universe, His Son has the key of David, which means His Son has... The access, he can, he can grant access to the very presence of God and to all of his treasures and riches. And Paul says some of those treasures and riches is our wisdom and knowledge. So that's another question, right? Today, do you need wisdom? Do you need knowledge? Let me tell you what. Don't trust everything you read on the Internet. You know, you go, you go, you go, oh boy, combing through the internet trying to find truth, you're going to be one mixed up person. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the, right. John 17, when Jesus was praying, he prayed to his father and said, Father, your word is truth. Some of you believe what you read on the internet more than you believe the Bible. Because so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said that, and blah, 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 blah. You're being tricked. Okay? You want the truth? Go to the Scriptures. Go to Jesus. In Christ is hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See? And He can grant you access to it when you need it. So, you know... Be careful. Be careful where you're looking for truth, where you're looking for information, or from whom you're looking for information. Your Lord has the key and access to it all. Why would you go anywhere else? And I'm not saying everything on the Internet is bad. It's not. We're on the Internet. <laughs> We're not bad. This will be on the Internet. This part of the internet you can trust. But a whole lot of it you can't. Be careful. But Jesus has the key to, to knowledge. Also, number four, let me give you this one and we'll start winding things down. He has the key to grant access. You ready for this one? To all of the promises of God. You know, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter said, God has made to us as believers great and precious promises. God's promises to us are great in that they're great in, in quantity. You know, when you read the Bible, there are a lot of promises God makes to you and me. A lot of them. 
And number two, they're great in their quality. In other words, the promises, the many promises God makes to us as believers, they're so unbelievable. They're so awesome. They're promises like this. Hey, if you sin, confess your sins to me, and I'm faithful and just to forgive you. What greater promise could you have than that? Call on the name of the Lord, and you shall be saved. I mean, we could go on and on and on. God's promises are just, they're so great because they're so unbelievable. They're so good. And they're precious, which means they're valuable. Why are God's promises valuable? Because He is true. Didn't He tell us He's true? He's dependable. Listen, I'm sure all of you here have been made, you've had promises made to you by different people. Maybe family members or friends, other Christian brothers and sisters, maybe even a pastor. And they didn't keep their promises. You don't have to worry about that with Jesus. All of his, pre- all of his promises are precious. They're valuable. And one of the greatest values to them is you can count on them because he's the one who promises to you. Let me give you a scripture for that, right? 2 Corinthians 1.20. Paul writes and says, For all the promises of God in him, that's in Christ, are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Isn't that amazing? All of God's promises that he makes to you as a believer in Christ, because of what Christ has done for you, God says yes and amen. And we say yes and amen to those promises because Jesus has the key, the power and authority to grant us access to all those promises. Wow. Man, is this, is this good stuff or what? This is incredible, isn't it? He who opens and no one shuts. Now, I want you to look at the rest of this verse. We're going to end. Look at the rest of it. He not only says that he has the key of David, and because of that, he opens and no one shuts, but then he also says this. Ready? Here it goes. He also says, and shuts and no one opens. Now, you know, we have a tendency, right, to look at the first part and go, yeah, amen, that's awesome. He has the key to open and to grant us access to all this stuff. Yeah, we love that. Then we read the second part where it says, and he shuts and no one can open. And we go, oh, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't like that. Well, let me tell you what. If Jesus shuts a door and locks it and doesn't let it open to you, it's for your own good. No matter how bad you want it. I remember Billy Graham's wife, Ruth, Ruth Graham, she used to say, if God had answered my prayers, or she'd say, she said this, if God had answered all of my prayers, I would have married the wrong man many times over. Sometimes Jesus shuts the door because it just isn't his will. And when it ain't his will and he shuts the door and he locks it, listen, okay? You can work as hard as you want. Wear yourself out trying to get your crowbar and pry it open. Try to get your hammer and try to beat that lock off. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. He loves you too much. Jesus loves you too much to leave a crack in any, any doors, in, in some doors that he just don't want you in. This can be a blessing to us. And you have to remember that. Now, you see that word shuts? He shuts and no one opens. Here's what's interesting about that word shuts. In Greek, it's the word klio. It's the word, it's the Greek word from where we get the word kleis, which is the word for key. Isn't that interesting? So the Greek word for key Here in verse 7, the key of David, the word kleis, comes from the Greek word klio, which means shuts. 
Why is that important? What do we have to have a Greek lesson this morning for? It's very important because it's telling us this. With the same key, Jesus unlocks and opens doors. He also shuts and locks doors. See? The same Lord who will open doors for you sometimes will shut them in your face and he'll lock them down because he knows better than you. See? And thank God he does. Thank God he does, right? <laughs> Listen, access to God's presence and all his treasures are at the discretion of the keeper of the keys. Never forget that, okay? And the only way to have access to God and to his riches is through a relationship with the keeper of the keys. Jesus Christ. That's the point. Do you realize this? Do you realize that in Jesus' first coming, he came as a baby born in Bethlehem, lived a human life perfectly, keeping God's law. But he came for what purpose? He came for the purpose of taking that human life and laying it down, that perfect sinless life, laying it down taking our sin upon us and going to the cross to make a way to put away our sins so that He could give us access to God, okay? Because we're sinful humans. We, don't, we can't have access to God because He's holy and we're not. We talked about that Wednesday in our last study. But here's the point. When Jesus came the first time, He came to this earth as Savior. He even said, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Jesus said, I came the first time as Savior. And for 2,000 years now, Jesus has been offering as Savior, He has been offering salvation to everyone and anyone who will believe, who will turn from their sins and put their faith in Him. And He's doing it even this morning for some of you. Okay? Now, the second time he comes, the second time he comes, he's coming not as Savior. He's coming as judge. In his second coming, Revelation 19, it says he comes to judge and to make war. Jesus is coming the second time as judge. That's amazing, isn't it? The same person who came to the earth the first time to offer you a way of salvation, to be your Savior, is coming the second time to be judge. This is why I'm saying he opens and he shuts. It's the same person with the same keys. The same person, for many of you, he's going to be your Savior. He is your Savior now. And he'll, in the future, he'll be your Savior. He's going to save you. One of the things He's going to save you from is the tribulation to come. We're going to learn that in the book of Revelation. But He's going to come to save you. But if you don't know Him and you're not in a relationship with Him, you don't have a relationship with the keeper of the keys, when He comes, guess what? He's going to be your judge. Isn't that amazing? The same one who opens and shuts is going to be the Savior and the judge. Don't forget that. It's very important. So make sure, make sure He's your Savior now. He has the key to grant access to salvation for you today. See? So it's important. So let me leave you with this. Let me leave you with a quote. Oswald Chambers. I love reading Oswald Chambers' writings. Though probably... 70% of them, I can't understand them. <laughs> Anybody else read Oswald Chambers? Anybody else admit you don't know half about what he's saying, right? That's when you know people are really intelligent, right? Is when they say things, and you're like, I don't get that. Yeah, they're so smart, you don't get it, right? So you all must have understood everything I said today, right? <laughs> well, that's my goal. But Oswald Chambers said this. 
He said, it is not God's promises we need. It's God himself. When you have a relation with the keeper of the keys, who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God himself, guess what? You have access to everything you need. You have access to all of his promises. You have access to his presence. You have access to to the knowledge you need. You have access to everything that you'll need. Isn't that awesome? So I cannot stress to you enough. Okay? If you're here today and you're not a believer, you haven't been born again, you're not a real Christian, or you're a believer and you are a Christian and you know it, let me give you one word of advice to all of you and to myself included. However much you make of your relationship with God now, whatever priority you put on your relationship with Jesus right now from day to day, whatever that is, however much it is or however little it is, however much you make of your relationship with God today, make more of it. Make more of it. Jesus is the keeper of the keys and has access to everything that you need. But the greatest thing you need is a relationship with Him. So whatever your relationship is with God today, make more of it. Make more of it.